Okay, everybody, so it is time to learn about the chain rule. And the chain rule is, I mean, I guess you could say the rules we've been learning have been building up to learning the chain rule. Uh, it's something that we'll use a lot, okay, from here on out. Now, uh, I could just tell you what the chain rule is. I'm aware of that. I could just cut to the chase, work the problems, and skip all the introductory inf information. But as it is that this is a video, of course, if you if you think you're ready to just learn the chain rule, then just skip ahead and you'll see it. But I think that it's good for most people to have some background, all right? But I'll let you decide if that's something that you need or not. I'll say this to start with, okay? The chain rule is used to calculate the derivative of a composite function, and I guess if we're going to learn how the chain rule works. We need to know what a composite function is. And I thought as, you know, in addition to giving some examples of composite functions, it might be good just to think a little bit about functions and order of operations. Here's what I'm worried about is that people depend so much on calculators that they don't really always know what they're doing. Okay? They just press buttons and hit enter and write the number down on paper in... You know, they get kind of spoiled on doing that, and they lose sight of, you know, the fact that in these functions, now these are all composite functions, every single one of these, there is an order of operations. There's an order that things are done that you can take for granted when you use a calculator. So let's say that I got this function f of x is x plus 1 to the fifth power. There's an order that things are done here. You calculate x plus 1, you get that number, and then you raise that number to the fifth power. So if I want to calculate f of 3, that would be negative 3 plus 1 to the fifth power. That would be negative 2 to the fifth power. That would be negative 32, okay? So yes, there's an order that you have to do things there. So often in calculus, I'll, I'll see people, if, if they have something like x plus 1 to the fifth power, they'll say, oh, that's the same thing as x to the fifth power plus 1 to the fifth power. And that's definitely not true. Uh, you're not following the order that things must be done. You will not get the same answer if you try to do it like that. Try it and see. Try it and, I'll give you a simple example. So 2 plus 3 squared. Is that equal to 2 squared plus 3 squared? True or false? So let's see, that's 5 squared, that's 25. And that's 4, and that's 9. Well, 25 is not 4 plus 9, so no, you cannot distribute exponents over addition or subtraction. Okay? All right. So, yes, I need you to appreciate the order that things are done. All right? So can we agree about that? Now, what about this function? This is a trig function. And the order here is that I tell you, like, so what's 2 times the number x? I do that first, and then when I'm done with that, I take the sign of that number, okay? So what's f of pi over 4? Uh, so that would be sine of 2 times pi over 4, okay? And that's uh, 2 times pi over 4, that's pi over 2, so that would be sine of pi over 2, and that would be 1. All right, no big deal, it's 1, okay? Let's do another one. What about this function, sine squared of x? What, does, what role does the square play in the order? Um, I'd hate for you to think that that had anything to do with the x. That square has nothing to do with the x. The, we could write the function this way if you want. Um, you might see it either way, but if you see it like this, you should be able to understand it like that. We take the sine of the angle or number x, and then once we know what that is, we square it, okay? So if we did f of pi over 4, that would be sine of pi over 4, whatever that is, and squared, and sine of pi over 4 happens to be 1 over root 2, and we square that, and 1 over root 2 times itself is a half. All right, so now do you get an appreciation, or at least get it on your mind that, yeah, there's an, in a function, if it's a composite function, there's an order that things must be done, okay? There's an order of operations, which everybody learns about when they learn arithmetic. Now, okay, so hopefully you're not, like, thinking that's so simple. It's an insult to your intelligence, but it's, you know, it's, it's not like I don't think you know that. I just think it, it might not be as fresh on your mind as it needs to be 
to understand the chain rule. Okay, so let's take this function for example. What's a composite function? So this is a composite function. How many functions do you see? And I'm not kind of breaking it down like this. I see two functions, like the exponent, the sixth power, that's one function, but then this thing inside of it, 4x plus 1, that calculation, that makes two functions. There's two functions there. And it's the order of operations that differentiates them. We calculate 4x plus 1 first, and whatever that number is, we raise it to the sixth power. So yes, there's an order of operations. Can you agree? All right. What about with this one? How many functions do you see here? Cosine of x to the third power. Well, again, that is a composite function. There are two functions there. There's one inside of another. You can think of it like that. Cosine of something, that's one function. And then x to the third power, that's another. There are two functions. It's, again, the, the way you differentiate the functions is the order of operations. We would have to say what is x to the third power first and then calculate the cosine of that. So that's what a composite function is. Now, you know, I really I think people can understand this when I tell them this kind of thing, all right? What I'm worried about is, you know, if you see notation, like that's, that's what's the hard part is just reading the abstract symbols. That's part of what we learn when we take math, and we prepare to learn engineering or science or something else that relies on math as we learn to read the notation. A composite function is like this in the abstract form. Y is a function g of u. Y is a function of u, and u is a function of x. It's like, you know, you there's this function here, and you, you plug that one into it. That's the way those were, if you think about it, all right? Okay, and that, here's the breakdown on both the examples I just showed you. All right, so that's how it is in general. That's what a composite function is. There's other ways to write this, but this is the one that will be useful for the chain rule, so that's what I'm going to tell you. All right, now, so hopefully we know what a composite function is. It's, it's like saying there's one function plugged into another one. All right, okay, so let's see. The chain rule can seem to take many forms. I'll give you lots of formulas over the course of the semester that will really all be the chain rule. But the chain rule is different depending on what functions you have. All right, so I'll give you some that we'll use a lot. I'll just give them to you directly. And then I'll give you the, the general form that they all really are when you get down to it, okay? So if y is u to the n power, y prime is n times u to the n minus 1 power times the derivative of u with respect to x. What's the u here? u is some function of x. So that's kind of like this. y is some function of x raised to a power. That's the u from the chain rule. Okay, so we'll do that example in a minute. But yes, in every one of these chain rules, u is some function of x. And if you think about it, that's how all the examples look before I got to this point, all right? Okay, so there's our derivative for u to the n power, some function of x raised to a power, uh, any constant power n. What's the derivative of y is sine of u, where u is, again, some function, some formula that involves x. The derivative of that will be cosine of u times the derivative of u with respect to x. So, if you look at these, you might start to see a pattern that the chain rule is going to look like the derivative of the outside function, just to speak informally about it, we'll call it the outside function, times the derivative of the inside function. So like that power is the outside function, and then the u, whatever that is, that's the inside function. Same thing with the cosine. What's the derivative of sine? Well, it's cosine and then times the derivative of whatever's inside it. That's what the du over dx is, okay? So most people will probably think, oh, I'm not gonna bother with the notation because I'll just think of it as derivative of the outside times derivative of the inside. And if you wanna think about that way, you know, I can't stop you, but uh, also later you're gonna get confused when you see a bunch of math notation and it doesn't say outside and inside, all right? Anyway, so there's more versions of it. I mean, there's a, a chain rule for every type of function, and I can't write them all down, all right? But they're like this. If y is g of u, 
u being some function of x, so that's a composite function, then y prime is g prime of u times the derivative of u with respect to x. That's the same thing. The derivative of the function g, which is like the outer function, times the derivative of u, which that's the inner function. They, the, every single one of those, even though I didn't talk about all of them yet, is like that. This is the only one I'm going to practice in this video, though. Okay? All right. What is the derivative of y is equal to u to the n power? Let's just focus on that one. We'll get good at that one, then we'll worry about the other. Okay, so, so here I've got y is equal to 1 minus 4x to the fifth power. So I'm saying that, like, that part right there, that's the u. u is 1 minus 4x. Okay? So in that case, y prime... So what did it say? What did it say? This is just like the rule we already learned. You bring that power down to the front and you subtract 1. That's what we learned about taking the derivative of x to a power. If you have u, some formula that involves x, it's a similar pattern. You bring the power to the front, you subtract 1, and then you multiply it times the derivative of whatever is inside there that's getting that power. All right? So I'm going to do this. 5 times 1 minus 4x to the 4th power, then times the derivative of that inside part. All right? What's the derivative of 1 minus 4x? It's negative 4. Okay. So, well, let's do this. Like, if it helps you to see it this way. The rule said n times u to the n minus 1 power, then times du dx. So that's the u. Bring the power to the front. Okay, keep the u there. Subtract 1 from the power. So I got that. Then multiply times the derivative of that inside part. That's what the derivative of u with respect to x is, the derivative of this function. Okay, there it is. Okay, that's it. All right, now, so you will, you'll definitely see a pattern. I mean, at some point, I'm not going to have to write the rule down, but if we're getting started, so I'll go ahead and do it. Now, this is all multiplied together. 5 times 1 minus 4 x to the 4th power times negative 4. And 5 times negative 4 is negative 20, okay? So I get negative 20. Might as well put those numbers together times 1 minus 4x to the 4th power. And there's my answer. I'm done at that point. Somebody might say, wait a second, wait a second. This is 1 to the 4th power times 4x to the 4th power. Now, remember in the beginning of the video, I said exponents, as much as you might want them to, don't distribute over addition or subtraction. That's as far as this one goes. You could take 1 minus 4x and multiply it out four times, but you, that would make a giant mess. It wouldn't make it simpler if we did that, all right? So we're done with this one. What about this one, okay? Well, um, my rule is for what? It's for the derivative of some function u, u being a function of x, to a constant power n. So I need to see it that way. And from other problems we've done before we learn the chain rule, you would have seen that I'll write the square root of something as the one-half power. I mean, that's true anyway. The square root of a number is the same as that number to the one-half power. But this will make it fit the rule. Okay? So, what's y prime in this case? Well, there's the u to the power. Okay? So, this is that inside function u. So, I'll say like that. u is 3x plus 1. And there's the power. What about the 4, though? What do you do in that case? What do you do when you have a constant times a function? What do you do with the constant in that case? In that case, you carry it down. And you multiply it by the derivative of this. Okay, by the chain rule. What's the derivative of this? Well, we bring this power to the front. Then we subtract 1 from this power. And then we multiply times the derivative of this. That's what the derivative of u with respect to x is. Here's this function u is a function of x. That's the derivative of it. u is the uh, dependent variable and x is the independent variable. 
All right, so this refers to that function right there and its derivative. So that would be three, right? What's the derivative of three x plus one? It's three. So now you're looking at the same rule as up there. Now, I've got a four times a half times a three. What is all that? That's going to be six times three x plus one to the minus one half power. It would be okay if you gave that, but you should know that this is the same thing as this, isn't it? That negative power, I was gonna send this to the denominator and it's a half down there and that means it's a square root. Okay, so either one of those is okay with me, all right? But you should know them both. All right, let's look at this one. So if somebody saw this one, they might say, this does not belong here because we could use the, the uh, quotient rule to do that. And that's true. You could use the quotient rule to do that. But I can see it like this one. Okay. All right, here's how. So why not write it as like this? Okay, is that true? That's true. If you multiply this, are you gonna get back there? Yes. And then so, could you see it like this? And you've got an eight and I can send this above the bar and have its exponent turn opposite. What's the exponent on four minus X? It's a one. What if I put it above the bar? Well, it changes to minus one. Then it's like that problem, see? So yeah, you can use the quotient rule to do this. Yeah, maybe it'll be easier to use the chain rule. All right. Okay, so that's how I'd like to show you this one. So let's see, we carry the eight, don't we? That's what we do with a constant in that case. And we multiply times the derivative of four minus x to the minus one power. And we find the derivative of that by the chain rule. We bring this power to the front. We take away one from it. And then this part of the chain rule this part right here, that's the derivative of whatever that thing in there was, which we're calling u. What's the derivative of four minus x? It's negative one, all right? You see why it's negative one. Four minus x all by itself, completely removed from this problem, is a line that has a slope of negative one. So the derivative of four minus x all by itself is negative one, all right? So there we are. now. What's this turn out to be? I got an eight times negative one. That's what that number is. I know you just see a dash there, but that's negative one times negative one. This is all multiplied together. Eight times negative one times negative one is eight. And I'll go ahead, I'll put that under here like so. Okay, so that's how we can use the chain rule to do that problem. I told you, I said you could do it by the quotient rule, which I'll write QR for that. If, if you want to do it that way, fine, but I thought it'd be still a good example to show you, all right? Okay, let's do something a little bit different. Um, I want to do this problem here next, okay? A is a function of B, all right? A is B to the third over B to the sixth plus one, all squared, okay? Uh, what's the derivative of a with respect to b? All right, I want to do that one, but I thought, let's see, how's this going to work out? How's this going to work out? So the derivative of a with respect to b, and, which means in that function, b is the input variable and a is the output variable. And this is the rate of change between the two of them. All right, we talked about rate of change in another video. Wouldn't that be like this? Two times b to the third. I'm gonna have a lot of stuff to write down with this one. So I'm gonna I leave this inside part alone. This is like the other examples we did. And then now that power is a one. So this power goes to the front. We leave the inside part alone and we take one away. Now it's one. And then like this part, what's this part? This part would be the derivative 
of the inside, right? And by the inside, I mean, you know, that stuff. You know, b to the third power over b to the six plus one. And then so now to do that, we have to use the quotient rule. So now we've got several things going on here. I wanted to get you this far and say, well, now I have to find the derivative of the inside. And there's a whole separate rule for doing that called the quotient rule. So how about this? How about this? Let's just go ahead and work that by itself. Let's just find the derivative of the inside by itself, make sure we're okay with that, and then that's what's going to go here. So I'm going to put this problem on hold, and I'm going to do this one, okay? So, all right, so say, like, this is just the inside part only of the problem that I was just looking at. How do you find the derivative of that? You use the quotient rule. It's the derivative of the top, 3b squared, times uh, b to the 6 plus 1, right? Minus the derivative of the bottom part. That's going to be 6b to the 5th power, and then times the top, so b to the 3rd, all right? Then you square this thing down here, b to the 6 plus 1 squared. So let's reduce a little bit. So what are we going to get up there? Um, let's see, I, I want to save... Well, I'll do this. I'll do this. I'll write it out. I was thinking about skipping a step, but okay. 3b, so I'm going to multiply through like that. So I'll get 3b to the 8th power. Okay. 3b squared times 1, so plus 3b squared. And then here, that's going to be minus 6. And when I multiply b to the 5th times b to the 3rd, I'll get b to the 8th. All right, so that's how that's going to work out up there. And down here, I'll get b to the 6 plus 1 squared. I'm not going to do anything with that. And then finally, I'm going to get what? Negative 3 b to the 8th power, because those are like terms, plus 3b squared. Okay. Now, I know I just said finally, but there's one more thing that we should do to this. These have a common factor of 3. Okay, and they also have a common factor of b squared. So I'm going to factor out 3b squared because that's the most that's in common there. And I'm going to get 1 minus b to the 6th. All right, can you see how that is? All right, okay, so we'll multiply back out. We'll say 3b squared times 1, that's this term. 3b squared times negative b to the 6, that's this one. I did reverse the order, but uh, it's easier to write the minus second. Okay, so that's what I want to give you as my final answer for this one. Now, this, what you're looking at right there, this is what goes here, right? That's the derivative of the inside. We use the quotient rule to do that. So now I can finish this. So let's see, I got, how about this? I'm gonna put two over one, because I'm dealing with fractions. And I, I want you to think, well, that's a two over a one, because I got these fraction bars there that I'm gonna have to deal with to keep everything straight. And I got b to the third power, b to the sixth power plus one. And then I just found this part. Here's what I found it to be. All right, when I worked that part separately with the quotient rule, I got 3b squared, 1 minus b to the 6th power over b to the 6th power plus 1 squared. Okay, now I need to put all this together. You see how this is three fractions multiplied together. Can you see that? All right, and how do you multiply fractions? You multiply them straight across. So what I'm going to see here is 2 times b to the third times 3 times b squared. So what's that? That's going to be 6. Am I right? 2 times 3. b to the fifth. Am I right? b to the third times b squared. Okay. Times 1 minus b to the sixth power. All right. That's the top part. 
And then what's down here? Okay, 1 times b to the 6 plus 1 times b to the 6 plus 1 squared. Okay, so what is, well, you know, these are like things, right? How do you multiply like things? You add the exponents. How many b to the 6 plus 1 are there? Well, there's one here and there's two more there, all multiplied together. So it's going to be b to the 6 power plus 1 to the 3rd power. Okay, then we're done with that one. Got that one finished. I wanted to do it in parts, though. I wanted to, like, get you here to get you see, like, yeah, that's how the rule works. That's how the chain rule is done. That's how we used it in the other problems. You see a pattern. But then realize, wait, we got another issue with finding the derivative inside. And we do that separately, okay? That's the, just the way I wanted to show everybody. You know, it's not the only way to do it, but it's what I was thinking. So let's do one more. Okay, so take this example where we want to calculate the slope of a curve at a given point. So here I've drawn, like, I'm not saying that this is like some super accurate graph of that. This is just like a little tiny portion of the graph of that right there, okay? But say we got the, that curve and there's this point on it where x and y are both 3, okay? All right. So can you find the slope of the curve right there? How steep is the curve right there? This is how steep it is, okay? But, you know, I can't, my graph is not really good enough to measure it with my protractor here, but you get the concept of what I'm looking for. Now, do you remember this? F of 3 equals 3 is the point on the curve. Function notation. That says if x is 3, y is also 3. Okay, which that's true if you calculate in there. F prime of 3 is the slope of the curve at the point where x is 3. So that's this is what we're looking for right here. So we need to find the derivative of that, and then we need to evaluate it at 3, and it will tell us how steep the curve is right there. Okay, all right. So let's do this. Let's, let's rewrite this function f of x in a way that I think would be a little bit more friendly to the chain rule. See how that's the fifth root? I'm going to write that as 8x to the third plus 9x, and the power will be 1 over 5, okay? All right, now I can use the chain rule for this like the others. Uh, if you need to see it, right here it is, like u to some power u is a function of x, u is a formula of that involves x raised to some constant power. The derivative of such a thing is n times u. Remember, you got to know what u is, to the n minus 1 power times the derivative of u with respect to x. I'm going to do exactly what that says, right? This part right here is the u, and if I follow that rule to the letter, it says f prime of x is one-fifth times u and then I subtract one from that and that's going to be negative four-fifths so this is n times u to the n minus one power then times the derivative of u with respect to x that's the derivative of 8x to the third plus 9x that's going to be 24x squared plus 9 all right so for ease of calculation, let's do, let's say f prime x is, so I'll write it this way, 20, let's put this on top, 24x squared plus 9, under the bar will be a 5, and 8x to the third plus 9x to the 4 fifths power. Okay. All right, now I want to find the slope of the curve at this point. And as I mentioned, that's evaluating the derivative at the value of x is 3. See how there's an x in the derivative? 3 goes in there, and the number I get out is the slope. Okay, all right, so we need to do f prime of 3 and do a little bit of uh, arithmetic calculations. So we'll get uh, 24... 3 squared plus 9, 5 times 8 times 9, oh, so sorry, whoops, 
8 times 3 to the third power is 27. I'm just going to write 27. 8 times 27 plus 27. 4 fifths. Okay. 9 times 3. I'm putting 3 in. Uh, so let's see. So 24 times 3 squared. 24 times 9 plus 9. So I'll get 225. And then this, 8 times 27 plus 27. And then you need to raise that to the 4 fifths power. And that's 81. And I multiply times 5. So you're going to get 405. 225 over 405. And a number like that is going to reduce. Okay. Uh, let's see. So these are both... I think 25 divides both of them. Let me see. Forty-five divides both of them. Let's see. Okay, yeah, so I'll reduce by forty-five. And that's gonna be five over nine. Okay. Well, there's our number. That's our slope. Okay, uh, how can you think about that? So I had this curve in this point, and I'm saying the slope there is 5 over 9. And so I guess that means that the curve looks something like this. All right, like that little piece of the curve, like if, if measured and so on. Let's see. So this is not to scale or anything, but... Just for instructional purposes, I'll say we're going to go right 9 and up 5. Oh, gosh, that is really not... I feel bad about that. So you're probably annoyed by this, but you could always just stop the video if you are. So there we go. That's a little bit better. So run. So here's our curve. All right. This is like a microscopically close to that point, looking so close to that point that the curve begins to look straight. Uh, then that's our rise over run, okay? You know, at the vicinity of that point 3 and 3, we're going to go right 9 and up 5, and that's how the curve is sloped there. So you know what the number means. What I gave you, then, is a little bit of a reminder about the derivative and the slope of the curve and all that meaning. And then to find what I needed along the way, I had to use the chain rule. But I hope it looked the same as the other problems. I hope that... You know, you practice a little bit, and you don't even have to think about the rule because you know all the problems that are like this look and are done the same way.